what was going on at the time. What you're seeing here in this nice little picture is a 1957 Chevy Bel Air convertible car. <laughs> yeah, they didn't all look like that, but they looked something like that, you know, with fins and stuff like that. Um, things that were happening in 1958. Uh, Costs of things, for example, a new house would set you back around $12,750. dollars If you translate that in today's dollars, that is $108, $140-ish dollars. So, you know, if you're not living, I mean, if you're living where I am, that's about an even trade right there. That 100 something for a decent house, that's about right. If you're living out on the coasts, uh, forget it. You know, obviously, you're never going to buy anything decent with only $100,000. If you're living out on the coast, I have to ask you why. <laughs> Come to the center part of the country. Trust me, everything's a whole hell of a lot cheaper out here. If you were uh, paying monthly rent, it might be in the vicinity for an average person or an average family of about $92. Today, that's $780. That's not too far off from where a uh, somewhere in between uh, kind of uh, a studio apartment might set you back in my part of the country. Probably need a couple of grand a month if you're going to do that. Yearly wages, if you were working on salary, might be in the vicinity of uh, $4,600, which, if altered to today's uh, currency, would be about $39,000, which is not far off from the actual median income in this country. A gallon of gas would set you back a quarter. Today, that would be translated into $2.12, and I don't know anywhere in the U.S. where it's that cheap. A new car might run you about 2,700-ish, and today if we converted that, that would be about $24,600. So still probably getting a pretty good deal on your car back then. Things that happened in 1958, and I'm going to get off into a tangent here in a second. There was a recession. Unemployment increased to 7%, or 5.2 million people. That was a recession for them. Look now at our current period of economic recovery. We have roughly 96,500,000 people who are out of work but are not being counted as out of work. These are people who are no longer in the workforce. That means they have been without a job for so long that no social safety net no exists for them anymore. They are therefore no longer counted as unemployed, despite the fact that there are 96,500,000 of them. Again, compared to the 1958 recession, 5.2 million people. And admittedly, the U.S., uh, I don't know what the U.S. population was then, maybe half, but still that doesn't translate, doesn't scale. You could double, triple, quadruple that, and you're still not going to hit. Let me see. You nearly, yeah, it's about nine times so if you increased that by nine times, that does not keep pace with the population growth in the United States at all. So 96,500,000 people are out of work, but not counted as being out of work because they have fallen off the rolls of unemployment and things like that. These are the people that you see living under one of California's, Southern California's many beautiful overpasses or in their homeless encampments because they don't dare stay around here this time of year because they might freeze to death. Now, we do have a number of 12,110,000 that they count as actually unemployed. Again, bogus number. Real number is that plus 96,500,000. And the entire U.S. population is about 330,000, a little less, 330,000-ish. Of that, they suggest, federal numbers, suggest that about 156 million of them are in the U.S. workforce. So let's take, for kicks, we will take the 96 million five that are unemployed but aren't counted as unemployed, add that to the 12,110,000 who are counted as unemployed. And then let's just for kicks divide that by the total population of the United States. That number will give us the percentage of people against the entire population of the United States that are out of work in this country. When we do, we find that it's 33%. Now that's against the actual total number of people in this country, in the United States. Let's run it against the people they count as being in the workforce. 
So if we uh, take our 96,500,000 who are actually out of work, add it to the 12,110,000 who are out of work and counted as such, and then divide it by 96 million plus uh, the 156,000, because that will give us um, the uh, actual number of people in the workforce, we find that more than 40% of the U.S. workforce is unemployed. Let me say that again. At the present time, in what is supposed to be a booming economy, something like 43% of the U.S. workforce is without jobs. All the numbers that you hear are completely bogus. See, government numbers are intended to do two things. The first is to reassure the populace that everything's fine, everything's cool, it's all getting better. And the other thing is to communicate to any potential enemies that you cannot touch us. Doesn't matter what you do, we will give you the beatdown of your life. So when you see those numbers, assume they're wrong. Go out to usdebtclock.org. I didn't remember to it. I'll put a, a link to it in the description below. And take a look at some of the real numbers. Because those are real numbers. They're not the jerry-rigged, bogus numbers that the federal government feeds us. Regardless of who is in office, they always do it. Keep in mind, too, that when we get up to, uh, to numbers of 33 and above percent, the Great Depression of the 1930s only peaked out at about 24 percent unemployment. I continue to say, if it were not for, for social programs, we would have bread lines, we would have soup kitchens, the homeless encampments and people living underneath bridges would be even worse than it is now. The problem is, those same social programs are part of what's causing the problem. What do you do? I have an idea what you do, but it would be painful. There is nothing that you can do right now to solve this problem that wouldn't be painful. But do not listen to the numbers that are going around because they are not accurate. They are jury-rigged and bogus, as they always have been and always will be. There has never been a time when those numbers have been accurate. Never have they been accurate. They have always been bogus. Getting back to 1958, however, the cars continued to get bigger and heavier and have more powerful engines. NASA was created and, in my, my opinion, thus inhibited the ability to get humans off this planet for damn near a century. Probably will be a century by the time we're all done. A lot of satellites were launched this year, uh, 1957 had been the year that the first satellite was launched by the Soviet Union, thus putting us into a space race, the United States and the Soviet Union. And this year we saw a lot of different uh, satellites being launched for a number of different purposes. And then there's the one that I found was weird. <laughs> uh, British guy by the name of Gerald Holton created the symbol in 1958. And this is something that hippies would glom onto from the 1960s on, largely in the 60s and 70s. <sighs> okay, thank you, Gerald Holton. I'm sure you didn't think of it as such, but boy, thanks you all to hell for this one. Uh, microchips were invented that year. Big, big deal because microchips would go on to form the basis of everything that we know about electronics and still do today. You would not have that thing sitting in your pocket right now were it not for the microchip. Check something real quick on my control panel here. Uh, I think you're lying to me about that. Okay. I just have to check and see whether it thinks I'm giving you a good enough feed here or not. Um, pope John Paul XXIII was made the Pope. The, um, the new movies that were popular that year included South Pacific and Gigi. TV shows that were popular and came out that year were Candid to Camera, The Ed Sullivan Show, Come Dancing, The Jack Benny Show, Panorama, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Popular singers of that era. Oh, we were right in the middle of the heyday of rock and roll. Elvis Presley was popular. So was Billie Holiday, Ricky Nelson, Frank Sinatra continued to be popular. The Everly Brothers, uh, Eliza, I'm sorry, Eliza Fitzgerald and Jerry Lee Lewis, as I say, right in the middle of the rock and roll era. Some of the legendary names were coming out of then. Okay, a little more context. I always like to show people this because I'm somebody who, by hook, accident, mistake, 
ended up getting involved in some de to some degree with costuming. I am no costumer. I'm no seamstress. Still am not to this day. Um, but I did get something of an appreciation for it. And so I know also as an actor, sometimes what you're wearing informs how you are as a character to some extent. I know it sounds weird, but it does. So I always like to bring in fashions when we get into old time periods like this. So this would be women's fashions of about 1958. And from point of fact, uh, this thing comes straight out of a 1958 Sears catalog. Um, Sears just declared bankruptcy, but in that day, they were the Amazon of the time. They were the guys that you would order things from uh, over the mail, and they would send it to you, and that included clothing. So this is consistent with what women of almost any age might be wearing at that point. Uh, even teenagers, younger girls might be wearing stuff very, very similar to this. What is always interesting to me, particularly when women's fashions, because sometimes you get into some really horrific things. The corsets that they had to wear for making this film, Dracula, for example, you get into some stuff that's really horrifying in terms of having to wear. So I'll go over here just so that you ladies in my audience are aware. If you think you got it bad now, man, try it back then. Um, what you're not seeing here. What you're not seeing, starting from the skin up, is a bullet bra, though they didn't call it back that man. It was just an off-the-shelf bra. What we now call granny panties. A uh, uh, garter belt and stockings, because pantyhose hadn't yet been invented. And maybe a girdle. If you don't know what that is, feel glad. I know what it is because I was a costumer. You gods. Um, and then over the whole shebang, because it was a lot of underwear, headlines, you would wear a full slip. Then would come the dress or the blouse and a skirt. And depending on the dress, well, some of these, it's not so evident here, but some of the 50s dresses and into the 60s slightly, um, were such that they poofed out at the bottom. And so that didn't just happen you had petticoats and God knows what else under there to make the dress poof out at the bottom. That's all the stuff you're not seeing. <laughs> As I say, ladies, uh, feel lucky. Uh, you may think you have it bad now, but it's nothing like what it used to be. Men's uh, clothing was not that much different from today. Um, the, the difference being that this is, and the same thing with the last picture, these were not um, a special occasion clothes. These were everyday clothes. If you were a man and you worked in an office or something like that, this is what you wore. You wore a suit, to coat, a suit, dress slacks, dress uh, shoes, black socks. Um, shoes might have very well, well, very well been leather wingtips. Hard to say, but you would be wearing them. You'd be wearing a tie, a dress shirt, and when not indoors or not doing something where it was socially required of you, you would also be wearing a hat. For men, wearing a hat was something of a coming of age. It was saying to the world, I am now an adult. Uh, children did not wear hats. Um, men did, at least in cities. It was different in the country. But in, in urban areas, men wore hats because they were adults. It was a big deal. Uh, and the hat, uh, well, I'll, I'll explain why it's a big deal in a minute. Um, it's a bigger deal than you might think. Now, with teenagers, they might have, and teenagers would definitely have been going to see this film. They might have had a little more leeway. The girls probably wearing the exact same thing as the adult women would. Um, guys, on the other hand, could get away usually with no tie, with no hat, with no suit coat. Um, they would still be wearing a button-down shirt of some kind and, uh, you know, nice slacks and um, nice shoes and socks, but they could get away. They didn't wear sneakers. They could get away with, you know, doing without all the heavy stuff. Then there was a class, a subclass of those people called greasers. These were usually guys that were into motorcycles or cars or that sort of thing. Contin considered to some extent something of a low life of the time, but they would generally be wearing t-shirts and leather jackets and things like that, jeans. But again, they were a subculture, kind of. So, here we get into the more complex stuff. Now, people who are watching me right now that are regular listeners know that I have talked about some of this stuff before. And the reason I talk about it again is because I don't think it's fair to say to some new viewer that might be coming in, hey, um, go do the, uh, the home reading here of this other three things that I talked about on my, you know, in the archives. So I am going to go over some of it. But a piece of it my um, regular viewers will not have seen. 
a piece of this is going to go over um, the fandom part of things. I realized uh, when I was doing the review setup for this, I went, oh, you know, I, t I say how I'm supposed to be documenting fandom, but I don't really. There have been occasions when I have, but I really not have been documenting it thoroughly. So you're going to get that tonight. You're going to get documentation of fandom of this period. So a date was a very, very different animal than today. There were two venues for dating in 1958. One of them was a traditional theater, and one of them was the drive-in theater. <laughs> traditional theaters, a uh, very different kind of thing than what we'd see now. If you were going on a date, if you were a guy, you would show up at your date's uh, house or apartment in your car, meet her at the door, or potentially maybe inside briefly if she was living with her parents or something like that. Depends. But you basically meet her at the door. You would escort her to the car. This was a symbolic, and I stress the word symbolic, show, show, show of protection. Much of what we're going to go through on this date is symbolic shows of protection. They weren't really intended to protect anyone. They weren't really intended to be condescending to the women. It was what was socially acceptable at the time. Now, what's socially acceptable now is not the same as it was in 1958, as will become obvious as I go through and do this. But it was socially acceptable by both genders then. Totally required socially, in fact. It was that socially acceptable that if you didn't behave this way on a date, well, women would get a reputation. You could both get a representation of, repre reputation of being kind of scumbags. <laughs> um, with a man, if you didn't do these things, you probably wouldn't get a second date. So, man would go to the door, escort the woman to his car. He would open the door for her. That was absolutely required behavior. And then he would hold out his hand for the woman to take and help her into the car. Again, not so much trying to treat women as walking on eggshells, but more a symbolic show of protection. Because think about this. Women, you're wearing all those clothes. Imagine for a moment that you can't just hop in and out of the car because of it, particularly if you've got one of those damn dresses that poofs up. It's going to take effort to get into the car and get everything settled. And so that's part of why this went on. Once the woman was finally settled with all that clothing, you could close the door, the man would close the door, go around to the other side of the car, hop in, and drive to the date. On the, uh, when he got there, perform the same thing in reverse, where you would, he would get out of the car first, go around to the passenger side, open it up, help the woman out, close the door. If you're walking to um, dinner or to a theater, the man would always walk on the street side. This goes back to an ancient custom with knights that the left side, well, I'm sorry, the, the street side is where um, a man needed to be because what if something splashed up from the street from a passing car or something like that? It would hit the man and not the woman with all her rather expensive and layery clothes. <laughs> Pardon me. So when you got to the uh, movie theater, or dinner for that matter, but theater, we'll say theater for this purpose. When you got to the theater, the man would hold the door for the woman. That was a required behavior. If you didn't do that, a man got a reputation as a pig. So he'd hold the door for the woman, allow her to go in, and when entering, would then place himself so the woman was on his left. Now again, throwback. In the ancient mists of time, in the time of uh, knights and things like that, the knights and uh, you know, swordsmen considered the left side was where you drew the sword and the right hand was what you used to wield the sword to fight with. So the left side was considered a position of honor. You were letting the woman go there because it left your hand open to draw your sword and then fight with it so you could fight on her behalf. It was, again, a symbolic show of protection. But when not on the street, that's where the woman went, was on this side, on the left side. So you go into the theater, she's at your left, you open the door to the theater proper for her because it would be utterly scandalous for you not to. You would be a scumbag. And then you would go down and find a row. Now, the man would find the row and, you know, probably say, does this look good to you, blah, blah, blah. And then he would walk down the row first, clearing the row for his date coming behind him. She would then sit down. He would not sit. She would, he would wait for her to sit down. And then he would sit down. And then finally, at the end of all of that, take off his hat. Because the hat has generally been a bit of a throwback 
to um, medieval times when knights wore helmets. Um, the notion was you were keeping your hat on until you were sure that it was safe, that you would not have to do any fighting. So by taking your hat off, you were saying, okay, we can be comfortable here. I don't have to worry about having to fight on behalf of this woman I'm with. All of this stuff just totally um, symbolic. Nobody thought you were going to have to fight with a sword. <laughs> this was totally symbolic. And again, it was required behavior on both people's sides. Now, what a movie of that period. Um, you'd see it differently than you would today. It's not unusual, for example, for a movie theater to have not one but two films running back to back. So you would get what they called an A movie, and that was simply the first movie in the row. Um, it didn't necessarily mean anything beyond that. And then you saw the second movie, the B movie. And the B movie was called that because it was second. It didn't necessarily have anything to do with the quality of the thing. Now, it was often the case that B movies were of lesser quality than the A movies. They were of lesser budget than the A movies, uh, but it wasn't necessarily so. Today, however, we call anything that kind of sucks a B movie. You know, if it's cheap, if it's badly made, we call it a B movie. Not really, not really. Uh, from, a, you know, a strictly, um, you know, uh, definitive wor way of thinking about it, we don't really have B movies anymore. But the term has come to mean anything that pretty much sucked. We call it a B movie. Other things you might see there, might see cartoons, almost certainly see cartoon or two. You might see a short subject like a documentary or something like that. You might see a newsreel, although TV was starting to become big at this time and uh, newsreels were kind of on their way out if they hadn't gone already. You might see one of the last few movie serials. Those had largely gone by the wayside a couple of years before because of television. Television was coming in and had episodic TV, and we didn't have these Saturday matinee serials anymore. But you might see them. It's possible. There were a couple. Leonard Nimoy was in one. You might have seen in a theater at this time period. Um, so that was what you were going to watch. That's at a theater. And by the way, man, you weren't getting none this time. You weren't getting any. Ever. If you planned on marrying this woman or even thought about marrying her whatsoever, you are not going to get any. Women at the time period, there was two kinds, virgins and sluts. That's all there was, real cut and dried. Any man that was uh, going to get some was not going to marry that woman. It was. Um, a woman's reputation in that respect used to be very, very important and certainly was then. You did not want to get a reputation for being a slut. So that was not happening. In point of fact, um, there was a very limited physical contact allowed on dates. Very, very limited physical contacts. Now, that's where scary movies came in. Because scary movies gave the couple an excuse to do a little social dance that doesn't exist anymore. But they would, it would allow the woman to pretend to be frightened, while at the same time the man pretended to be consoling. And so you could get a little snuggling going on there that maybe you wouldn't get otherwise. So uh, going to a scary movie was, you know, like I said, it was an excuse to have this little social dance. I can't think for a moment that most women were actually scared by this stuff. And I don't think... I don't think the men were under any particular illusions either. It was just a social dance that you had to do. But... Then, tail end of this decade, about now, a little before, came the drive-in movie theater. i got a picture here somewhere. This is an aerial view of a modern drive-in movie theater. It does not uh, bear any significant difference between its uh, ones that existed 60 years ago. It is essentially a very large pocket and parking lot in kind of a diamond shape. The uh, cars would come in on one side, go into the parking lot, park, and then the screen is the large rectangular object at the front, kind of like a screen. Uh, the structure in the center there is the projection booth for that screen, as well as a uh, fairly well-stocked and put-together uh, 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 concession stand. Now, interesting thing about that is w when drive-in movie theaters first came out, now this is a place where you could go watch your movie from the comfort of your own car, and it uh, didn't necessarily have some of the same things that a theater did, but that was for time constraints. They 
they did and still do. Um, these still exist. They are not totally gone. There's a few of them still around. If you got a chance, I suggest you go and go to one. They usually have two, they always have two films. Um, usually the second one will be kind of crappy compared to the first one. And that's because you can't start a drive-in movie theater until dusk. So depending on what time of year it is, depending on which direction the sun was with respect to the movie screen, could be 9 p.m. before you started your first movie. So if you have two films, well, you're going to start the second one like around 11 p.m. And maybe you don't want to stay until 1 a.m. You know, maybe maybe the second one sucks so bad that you just leave, which I've done both of. <laughs> um, so the second one tended to be crappier, more a B-movie in what we now consider a B-movie sense. Might have also seen some other things. You might have seen cartoons. In fact, you almost certainly did. I know I saw cartoons when these were still alive and a going thing when I was a teenager. Um, probably not a newsreel or anything like that, and probably not, uh, almost certainly not, a serial, but two movies and some cartoons. And then <laughs> you would have a long, long trailer in between the two films, like 10 minutes long. And this would be nothing but a big, long advertisement for their concession stand. Now, I have as an emergency trailer because it's about eight minutes long. I have a trailer that comes directly off of that. It was a trailer that was used at those. I'm not going to run it 10 minutes, just going to let it run long enough for you to get a feel for it. Show starts in eight minutes. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. Yeah, it's pretty much like that the entire ten minutes. A ten-minute advertisement to go to the concession stand, and that's what you're seeing there. Uh, if I let it run, it'd be a full eight minutes. Mine is a full eight minutes long. But it's it's got just nothing but ads for the concession stands with the same time that very pleasant-sounding announcer, announcer between every minute is going, show starts in five minutes, you know, over and over again. I watched quite a lot of those. <laughs> just a big, giant advertisement to go and buy something. So the thing about drive-in movie theaters, all of this stuff. Oh, by the way, the drive-in theaters I was going to mention here. Oh, well, I've got the speaker up. Drive-in movie theaters had to get their sound to you somehow. The very first ones simply had very large speakers next to the screen. Well, that didn't work out so well because it was hard for people to hear. So they got these little monsters instead. These are the speakers. Now, only one of those would go in your car. There was no stereo or nothing. One of these speakers would go in your car. It is about life-sized here. Compared to my head, that is about right. It is a big, giant metal affair, and it is metal for a reason, because this thing would sit on a post next to where the cars would drive into. So what you're seeing there is either side of the post. You're seeing one on one side and the other one over on the other side. So the car would drive in on one side, the other car would drive in next to it, and they'd each take a speaker. As I say, those are about life-sized. Um, the speaker itself was made up of metal because it was going to be sitting out in the wind and the rain and the snow and God knows what else. So it had to be something that was not going to fry the speaker or at least, you know, let the speaker run. And it would work in inclement weather like rain. And it was also terrifyingly bad sound. It's a big metal box. The speaker behind it is maybe like this, right? A small fracking speaker, nice and tinny. And now the sound is rattling around inside that metal box. Um, not very popular in terms of that respect. But the thing about it was the drive-in movie theater was a big, big advancement technologically, a very large technological advancement. It took the movie out of a movie theater where you had very limited social contact on dates and put it into the comfort and seclusion of your car. This meant, and it was often the case, that when you went to an outdoor movie theater in the 1950s, you might do some making out with a girl that you couldn't otherwise do. You might try some moves on her, but she would certainly be expected to say no and would be considered something of a slut if she did anything other. It also invited your friends, who might know that you're there, to come around and try to embarrass you, to find you, to, uh, you know, uh, cock block you <laughs> and get in the way and make fun of you uh, if they found you doing stuff like that. 
And the movie theater did spawn, I think, the movie theaters did. It's the only place I've ever heard it. Drive-in theaters spawned a saying. If the car is a knockin', if the car is a rockin', don't come knockin'. By the time I was going to these things when I was in uh, high school-ish, they were still around. They were starting to die, but they were still around. Going to a drive-in movie theater was damned like, near like having an excuse to go have sex. <laughs> Uh, nobody that I knew went around trying to find anybody anymore because we all knew what we were going to go there for. Um, but that was a saying, if the car is a rockin', don't come knockin'. One other last thing about these speakers. They did not last forever. Um, by the time they had relatively small AM and FM lower power transmitters, they replaced those with those. Now, as you can imagine, those things are attached by a wire freaking wire attaches those to the post. I can't tell you how many times I or a family member or somebody I knew must have left that thing attached to their car door and drove off, yanking the cord out from under, went to movie theaters from time to time where there'd be as much as 5 to 10 percent of the speakers that were shot because of that. So when it became possible to do low power AM and FM radio broadcasts, they replaced those with those. Instead, they would broadcast the sound straight in on your car stereo, which by the time I was doing it, meant a pretty fracking amazing car stereo most of the time. But it was still a very large um, uh, advancement both in technology and sociologically. It took what had been something that you had to watch in a theater in a way that you could not get away with very much physical contact into something that was much more secluded, more private. And frankly, after the uh, AM and FM transmitters came out, better sounding than uh, a lot of theaters. So. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds. <laughs>